We are taught by the Apostle Peter in the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I think you've heard others point out that to give an answer translates the Greek word apologia, which means apology, and thus you get apologetics when it comes to the study of the defense of the existence of God, the deity of Christ, the plenary verbal inspiration of the scriptures, miracles, etc. So we are expected in our being faithful to God to be able to give a reason, not some sort of emotional outburst, but a reason for why we believe what we believe. Now, we know that our faith is formed by the Word of God, by what it teaches, by the evidence it reveals to us. And we need to follow that always, Romans 10, 17, because we're to walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 7. So today I would like for us to deal with what has been considered to be a bit of a hard or difficult question for some to answer. And it may even cause some to be quite squeamish when the atheists in particular wants to raise this question, I will use simply as a text 1 Samuel chapter 15 verses 1 through 9. 1 Samuel chapter 15, 1 through 9. Now, in that text, you find Samuel recording for us God commanding King Saul to go smite the Amalekites utterly destroy them, verse 3, all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Now we're not interested in pointing out that Saul said I did it when he didn't do it. That's a great lesson because Samuel says at the end of this, it's better to obey than the sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams, thus teaching the importance of faithful obedience to God. But the question that comes out of this that I want to answer this morning is that in the Old Testament, verse 39 books of the Bible, at least in portions of it, why did God command the killing of children? Why did God command the killing of children? And you just heard it read to you there, smite the Amalekites and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So such a, a question as I've posed to answer then sometimes are difficult in our minds to be able to answer them yet I read to you 1 Peter 3.15 where we're taught to be prepared. That's what sanctify means. Set yourself apart. That means do the necessary study. Know the answers and be able to give a reasonable answer to people for what you believe in practice. And of course we know that Jude verse 3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. King James Version, American Standard 1901 says, once for all delivered to the saints. In other words, there's no new revelation. When the last word of revelation in the New Testament was written, there hasn't been any more revelation from God. But nevertheless, both of those passages tell us that we're to stand up for the truth. And that in order to do that, we have to prepare ourselves to stand up for the truth, whether it's the teaching of the plan of salvation, 
or matters pertaining to the existence of God or such a question as this concerning why did God command the killing of children. One avenue of undermining faith in people is to find what appears to be conflicts and especially what appears to be moral conflicts because people have an, well, they just uh, stand askance at the idea of a nursing baby killing it. God said you do that. You go to Jericho and the children of Israel led by Joshua, they were given the same command. But we forget sometimes that uh, he who created all things owns all things. I'm going to emphasize that more in a minute. But a lot of folks have a hard time wrestling with these things. And this question is one of them. One reason is because children are so innocent. Why would God order their deaths? Well, let me point out some things about the atheist, and that's a person who says, I know God does not exist. There are no spiritual anything. About that person, you know he doesn't believe in God. Thus, he does not believe in any absolute, objective, moral code. And besides that, atheism has long supported the killing of children in the form of abortion. Why should this concern them? They justify the destruction of, quote, unwanted, unquote, children. And all of that's just for their convenience. So we're dealing with a lot of folks who, though they may not realize it, they've only been exposed to one side of a matter. But when it comes down to it, they are hypocrites when it comes to launching an objection to the Bible being the Word of God or the existence of the God who reveals Himself in the Bible as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when they try to do that kind of thing. Let me make this statement once again as I've made it in the past and will continue to make it. Atheists, people who say there is no God, are mad because they're not God. I have never seen or read after any of them that they did not want to be a part of those who say the rest of you dumbbells who aren't as smart as we are must do what we tell you even though we're not bound by those things. Just look around about you. This is especially true nowadays. This country is very quickly becoming completely unfriendly to the God of the Bible. Militantly and harshly opposed to God and Christ and anything of Christianity. And you might as well get ready for it and realize the value of 1 Peter 3, verse 15. There's no use trying to play like it doesn't happen and it's not that way. No, it's happening. As I speak, it's happening. So we need to be ready to answer questions like this as well as other questions. So to claim that God is unjust for ordering what they, the atheists, think is morally correct, is for them a very insincere position to say the best. Next, to claim that the killing of children is wrong, and that's what they're doing, you know. They're claiming the kill, killing of children, like the Amalekites, is a wrong thing, and what a terrible old ogre God is for doing that. But they don't realize, maybe, that in order to call God wrong, they are appealing to a moral code outside themselves. And by their actual opposition to God doing that, they are actually, though implicitly, affirming that there is an absolute objective moral code to determine what is right and what is wrong. And thus, their position is self-defeating. 
And this undermines then their own belief that morality, morality is relative and subjective. Well, it just comes down to this. You can't have it both ways. You just can't do it. Finally, as soon as the phrase innocent children is used, then the atheists are admitting the existence not only of a moral code, but also that there is sin in the world and adults are responsible for moral choices, ethical conduct. When you talk about morality as a standard, then you say moral. When you're talking about it put into practice, then you're talking about ethical conduct. Now, it may come as a surprise to everybody, but people die. They do it all the time, every split second of every day, all day long. And Hebrews 9, verse 27 makes it clear it's appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. So we must remember that this argument that they try to use, and I put this argument in quotes, is selected for its, listen, emotional charge. It's the death of little sweet babies. It's by the sword. Horrible. So the answer to ignore the emotions must be just that. You cannot allow emotions to enter into those matters. That's one reason that uh, it's a good rule of thumb for doctors not to practice medicine on their own family. Our attorneys to be the attorney for their own family. Because your emotions can very easily get in between you and what rationally needs to take place. It happens all the time. And our world is very irrational. You just look around at people and certainly it impacts the Lord's church. People in the church, when it comes to their families will augment the Lord's word just about as fast as people out of the church if they're going to have to deal with some of their family's conduct that's sinful. No, nope. applies to you, doesn't apply to mine. That's nothing but an irrational approach. Certainly won't work on the day of judgment. There is an assumption that we have the right to live and that God does not have the right to take away life. Did you get that? There's the assumption on your part and mine, but especially people who are not Christians and all that the Bible defines that word to mean. There is the assumption that we have the right to live and that God does not have the right to take away life. Well then, by what right do you have to give life? Ezekiel 18 and verse 4. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4. Listen how simple this is, but look how bold it is. But it's only natural, if you want to use that term, to one who is the creator of all things. Behold, all souls are mine. Is that hard to understand? That's God speaking. All souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth. It shall die. Of course, that's one last part of that we use correctly to point out that uh, sin is not inherited like the color of our eyes from our parents and so forth. And that sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Thus, the person who is separated from God is separated from God because of that person, a free moral agent with a will to choose chose to violate God's will. Eve was punished because she chose to violate God's will. Adam was punished because he chose to violate God's will. The point I want to make here is that God says, Behold, in other words, if you've never realized this before, the spotlight's on it now, all souls are mine. Death exists, and remember it does mean annihilation. Are going unconscious. 
But death means separation from God. So death exists because man violated God's command and let death in with his sin. So all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And that harkens back, of course, to Genesis 2.17. We continue to deal with death to this day as a result. And we all will, however long this world exists, until, as you read the New Testament, Christ comes back and does away with all material things, assigns the devil, his angels, and all those who live contrary to God's will all their lives to the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second and its eternal separation from God and all things that pertain to God. Because the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Well, that's done because sin is destroyed. And sin is destroyed because there will be no longer a place for sin or he who causes sin, the originator of sin. If God cannot take life, then all deaths would be wrong, not just the deaths of children. So we accept the fact that everyone dies. The elderly, the very elderly, the nearly elderly, the middle age, whenever that is, and the young and the very young, and so on. I emphasize again that this process will go on until Jesus conquers it. 1 Corinthians 15, 25, and 26, I noted a while ago. Now, what permits us to continue to live in the flesh on this earth? God, you're here this morning because God permitted you to live to this point. 2 Peter 3, 9. God is not slack concerning his promise. That's this promise of Christ to return the second time, as he's promised to do. But is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So when you look at your watch and you see it, clicking right along, know that God is being merciful to people to give them time, literally, to repent, having heard the truth, understood it, and applied it properly. God doesn't want the wicked to die because it ends all hope of repentance. That's why when we see very wicked people that we who have been purchased from our sins by our belief and obedience to the gospel, having our sins washed away by the blood of Christ and the waters of baptism, and living daily as the New Testament says Christians are to live, thus being covered by the blood of Christ, 1 John 1 verse 7. That's the reason we're still to do good to folks. Listen, your worst enemy, and this amuses me, but it sadly amuses me, when people say, oh, he escaped justice. There's no way anybody can be any more just than God on the day of judgment. That's why he says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. So that's coming. Pointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So he doesn't want the wicked to die. Listen to this. But if the wicked will turn from all the sins that he hath committed, you know, that would include Stalin. That would include Charles Manson. You don't know who he is. You have to do the history study. It would include Hitler. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So if they'll turn from their sins, notice that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. Now you think about that for a minute. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Now watch this. This is God Almighty. God who is love. The just God. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? 
saith the Lord God. And not that he should return from his ways and live. Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 21 through 23. How gracious and merciful and full of loving kindness God is. So in this world, as I said, people die. Who is the only one that can offer you real life? John 10, verses 9 and 10, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Then he says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Again, John 10, 9 to 10. Now, there's only one who can give you life. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Sin is a contagious thing. Now, we're all up there about COVID-19, things being contagious. I promise you. Is nowhere nearly as contagious as sin is. But because it is contagious, that is sin, then it must be controlled. Now, again, you read your Old Testament, and it was, remember, written a fourth time for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures, might as Christians living faithful to Christ in the New Testament have hope, expectation of eternal life. So I want you to consider why did children die in the flood? Listen to what you have in Genesis 6, 5, and 6. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. So I'm back to the question of the light of that. Why did children die in the flood? They're innocent. And the simple answer is, is this. Because of their evil parents. At this very hour, some poor children somewhere are suffering because of evil parents. Is that God's fault? Or is it the devil's fault because those parents are tools of Satan? Despite the parents' bad choices, notice that God does not hold those choices against the children. They will have as innocent children eternal life despite their parents' sins many of those sins done against them. Consider the Old Testament account of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain that God destroyed in Genesis 18, verses 20 and 21. Don't you know children lived in those cities? Babes and sucklings. Now when it came to the Amalekites, God used Saul and the Israelites as his tool to destroy them. In the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, he directly acted to do it. But nevertheless, children were killed in both cases, and they were all innocent. Abraham knew God would do something about Sodom and Gomorrah's sin. Just go back and read the record. Abraham asked that the innocent be spared. And eventually ask that the cities be spared if only ten righteous people could be found. Well, you know, it doesn't even come out there that if there's ten, what about all those innocent children? He wasn't even considered the innocent children. They're just innocent. They're not going to lose their souls if God takes their life. He's simply going to take them home to escape them walking in the very evil shoes of their own parents. 
Of course, 10 is not a very large number when you consider the population of several major cities. Though they may have been smaller than New York or Chicago or Houston or someplace like that, they were still very large cities. But 10 couldn't be found. Originally, Lot, his wife, and two daughters were rescued. Of course, Lot's wife couldn't help but look back and turn to a pillar of salt, so she wasn't totally rescued, but she fled the city. So it was the refusal of the evil people to listen that resulted in the death of their children. Did you let that sink in? How many parents know that drinking alcohol or using drugs is not good for them? And they, under the influence of those things, do all sorts of things to their wives and children or to husbands or whoever's in their family. But it doesn't stop them, does it? Yet because of their sins, they hurt others. So it was the refusal of evil people to listen that resulted in their children dying. You think about people who don't go as far out into evil as those of Sodom and Gomorrah, but they just won't follow the Bible. They turn to human religions or philosophies. And they won't follow what the Bible said to do to become a Christian, and so on concerning New Testament Christianity. And they rear their children in that atmosphere. What have they done? They've led their children down the wide path to destruction. I think Nineveh, and this tells us one reason, it's in the scriptures along with these others that God destroyed, illustrates the opposite then of Sodom and Gomorrah and the flood and the children of Israel destroying the people out of the land of Canaan. You know that God had decided to destroy the city of Nineveh which would destroy the evil in it because evil doesn't bother anybody except that people do it. God sent Jonah to warn the people that they had 40 days to repent and then God was going to overthrow them if they didn't, Jonah 3, 4. But in reading the text, they did repent and God didn't destroy the city, Jonah 3 and verse 10. Now look what happened. These people, by listening to God and repenting, not only save themselves, but they save their children. Because they changed their evil lives to comply with God's will. Now, I've mentioned Canaan off and on. What about those, those in Canaan at the time the children of Israel came in to take the land? Well, first of all, time means nothing to God. I wish we could get that in our heads. We quote it a lot of times, but we still don't think that way. God told Abraham that his descendants would inherit the land of Canaan. But the time he had told him that, that actual inheritance was 400 long years into the future. Listen to Genesis 15, verse 16. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, he says to Abraham, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. That tells us so much about God bearing with people, giving them time to repent. But God, knowing the object of all things, He's omniscient, knowing the heart of every man. He knows when men have reached the stage to where you can give them all the time beyond that, but it's not going to change things. It wasn't because Israel was so deserving of the land. They forgot that a lot of time. But God was accomplishing at least two things at the same time, two things at once. He was removing a sin-ridden, hardened people and fulfilling a promise to Abraham. Listen to what we have. Speak not thou in thine heart. After that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, for my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess the land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. Not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go to possess their land. 
But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, and that he may perform the word which the Lord sware unto thy fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Deuteronomy 9, 4 through 5. Even with these nations, sometimes we forget this, God gave them the opportunity to flee. Go back and read Joshua leading the armies of Israel and taking the land of Canaan. And if those folks got out of the way and left the land, they didn't pursue them. In Deuteronomy 4, 37 and 38, And because he loved thy fathers, therefore he chose their seed after them, and brought thee out in his sight with his mighty power out of Egypt to drive out nations from before thee greater and mightier than thou art to bring thee in, to give thee their land for an inheritance as it is this day. So a reason for their destruction was their refusal to take the loss of their land as punishment for their sins. So if they stayed and fought, they died. All of them did. But they could leave and go somewhere else. The Canaanites were not, this is putting it mildly, were not good people. They were exceedingly evil. And they weren't getting any better. I won't try to read now, but let me give you this to read that God describes them how they were. In Leviticus, chapter 18, 20 through 23. Write that down. Go back and read how inspiration describes these people at the time the children of Israel came in to take the land. Leviticus 18, verses 20 through 23. You'll notice that among them was the fact, now think with me here, brethren, they were killing their own children. Does a bell go off in your mind regarding this country? It was such disgusting, disgusting immorality that everyone involved had to be destroyed. Remember what I said about this being contagious, sin being contagious? Or that sin would continue to spread. Let me give you some more scriptures to read later. Leviticus 18, 24 through 25, that's in the same chapter I gave you a moment ago Leviticus 18 24 through 25 and Deuteronomy chapter 12 verses 29 through 31 Deuteronomy 12 29 through 31 now watch this God chose to destroy the adults and bring the children the innocent children the babes and the sucklings home to him Remember, all souls are federal governments. All souls are mine. By right of the fact, he's the creator. Of all involved, the children received the greatest mercy. Because if they grew up in that culture, they would have died in their sin just like their parents died, and we all know where they went after their death. They were spared the fate of their parents. Deuteronomy 139. But like Israel, the child suffered for their parents' sins. Israel committed all sorts of sins, wouldn't listen. Prophet after prophet after prophet was sent unto them. Wouldn't change. So the children suffered because of the parents' sins. In Numbers 14, 33, And your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. And everybody 20 years old and upward died in the wilderness, save Joshua and Caleb. Remember, the Canaanites did not have to die. I know that because of another example that tells me much about them. Anybody remember Rahab? Rahab showed that God accepted those who changed. Tell me this. Why couldn't 
everybody in Canaan do what Rahab did. If Rahab had the ability so to do based upon the facts that she had heard regarding the children of Israel, then so could everybody else. She and her family were not a part of the destruction of Jericho. You ever notice why? Because Rahab acknowledged God and his justice. Joshua chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. Joshua 2, 8 through 13. Notice that the people of Canaan had both advanced warning and encouragement to run. But they didn't. Just read what Rahab said. We've been hearing about you ever since you left Egypt. And there's been things going on with you folks that hadn't happened with anybody else. And you have prevailed every time. So they could have changed. But being a free moral agent, they chose not to. And that's like most people. So and it was their sins, it was their stubbornness that led to the destruction of themselves and their children. Now, here's another thing that needs to be understood because of the way the Bible's written, it looks like these things just happen time and time again, but actually such destructions were rare. We forget the Bible covers thousands of years of history. And only significant, necessary events that teach us are recorded. Because the Bible is unfolding the scheme of redemption down through time. It doesn't cover uh, Abraham out taking care of the sheep or Sarah making a new dress or whatever. It's not interested in that. It's not the purpose of it. It's easy, though, for us to think that when we read one destruction of one destruction, well, another one followed right after it and so on. But that's not the way it worked. What we should note is that it really was rare. It only happened with, when sin really got out of control. And the all-knowing God saw these people aren't going to change no matter how much more time I give them. Now we get an inkling. It's what's going on in the mind of God when he decides to destroy this world forever. But I don't know when that's going to be because I don't know his mind. I don't know what he knows. Even then God, that is at the time these things happened, gave those destined for destruction a chance to repent. And as I've said, in some cases, a chance to escape death. What we need to do is realize the inconsistency and hypocrisy of those who deny the existence of God and yet still want to hold God accountable to an objective standard which they deny to exist in the first place based upon their own judgment of God, the creature judging the creator that they deny to exist in the first place. We need to put responsibility where it belongs. It was the choices made by adult sinners that led to the death of the entire group, including their children, whom some were already killing themselves. So when God takes the life of these little children, babes, and sucklings, being that they're innocent, he just gathers them home and relieves them of all the mess they would go through to have to stay here and grow up under parents and in the culture that denies God. And don't you know at the end of time, that's the end of time for babes and sucklings, as well as the wicked and the righteous adults. We've got to realize God is not a man. He is self-sufficient. He didn't need us. And he doesn't need us. It's by his grace that he created us. God is, he doesn't need us for anything. He's not made any more God because we love and obey him than if we all rebelled against him. He's still God. I don't know all of what's going on in God's mind as to why he's done what he's done and what he has in store for those who are resurrected with the glorious body of Christ in the world to come. I just know he knows what he's doing. And he's true to his promises. And I know that sin lies at the door of your life and my life when we know the truth of God, but we reject it. 
And I know there's an end coming for every one of us. But then there's that final reckoning, giving account of the deeds done in the body at the judgment, and the final sentence, depart from me, or enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. We hold the key. What will we do with our lives on earth in the flesh? We dare not blame God because we don't like him. And I suggest even in the church, as I started out with, we better be very careful. Very, very careful. Lest we try to say, all this applies to you. And we're going to hold your feet to the fire. But don't do that with me and mine. I know where people like that are going to wind up because I can read and understand my Bible. So we need to believe the truth with all of our being. Repent of our sins. Confess our faith in Christ. And be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. That's the plan of salvation. There is no other. Less than that you cannot do and be saved. More than that you're not required to do to become a Christian. Be added to the Lord's church by the Lord himself. As a child of God then we must choose to live as the New Testament teaches. Teach it. Defend it. Be prepared to answer questions like this. And to know that all souls belong to God by right of the fact he is the creator. And that he will handle things as he sees fit. If as a child of God you sin, we are to repent. And if you'll do that, now's the time to do it while we stand and sing.